Okay, here's the second of a number of uh, slide decks that are uh, focusing on infectious disease therapeutics. Here we'll, we'll review the antibacterial agents and we'll go through them more in depth uh, when we talk about each uh, specific condition. Uh, but the focus here should be really getting down the antibacterials. What we'll require you to do in some part is to merge what you remember uh, from basic microbiology and other infectious disease content about which pathogens are involved or a focus of our uh, approach and care. And then we'll look at the therapeutic end of it. Uh, and this block will just review the antibacterial drugs themselves. Like we did in the prior slide deck, here's the 747. So when you see these, it's a little uh, less of uh, a detailed focus and more of a big picture focus. And this explains that big picture focus. So the objectives in this block are to cover the antibacterials. And in clinical practice, at least in North America, uh, uh, use and familiarity with antibacterial drugs is, in a sense, going to be the mainstay of your practice as it relates to infectious disease uh, for most of you. Uh, and so in practice, we need to differentiate these agents. First, we'll talk about the beta-lactam antibacterials, which primarily affect the bacteria. So wall, we'll talk about drugs that are considered beta-lactams, their cross-reactivity, uh, as far as it relates to both spectrum of activity uh, and hypersensitivity uh, type reactions. We'll talk about other antibacterials as well. There are many of them, and we'll talk about them and differentiate them in terms of uh, both mechanism of action and uh, spectrum of activity. So let's first look at the number of drugs that weaken the bacterial cell wall. Of them, a subset of them are the beta-lactams and a subset of the beta-lactams are the penicillins. So let's first start with the penicillins, probably appropriate to start here. Uh, penicillins uh, have this chemical structure with what's known as a beta-lactam ring. And in this slide, you can see the image in red of the beta-lactam ring. And most beta-lactams, or all beta-lactams, have to some degree either this very configuration of this ring in red, or something like it, something similar to it. Uh, you will see on either end of it, though, there are other compositions, uh, other components of the molecule that render it different and might affect its spectrum of activity. Uh, but the beta-lactam ring uh, also correlates in many cases, uh, in most cases, with the risk for hypersensitivity reactions. So if somebody has a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction anaphylaxis, for example, uh, to a beta-lactam antibiotic, there is a risk they could pose that risk for any other beta-lactam. So having familiarity with which drugs have beta-lactams, what's the cross-reactivity for someone who's allergic to one of them, that's an important consideration uh, in your practice. The mechanism of action of beta-lactams, they work to weaken the bacteria cell wall. Uh, if the bacteria cell wall gets ruptured, then that's pretty much the end. That's, uh, they're, they're considered uh, bacterio uh, cytal or they uh, kill bacteria, um, <clears throat> but they only really work with bacteria that are actively going undergoing cell division or uh, differentiation. And so what we'll find is that in clinical practice, uh, you'll find that these antibiotics, while they're bactericidal, the most vulnerable point is when the bacteria is dividing. Since we as humans don't have bacteria cell walls, they don't really have a lot of adverse effects with the exception, the major one, being hypersensitivity reactions. <clears throat> the, uh, the concern with bacterial resistance and resistance to penicillins happened pretty early on in their uh, introduction to Western health care. Uh, we see that there are uh, a number of uh, microbes or bacteria that are resistant to or, or don't hit the spectrum of many of the beta-lactams. One of those are gram-negative pathogens that at least penicillin itself uh, has some limited role in uh, covering a number of gram-negatives, as well as any uh, or, or a subset of those gram-negatives include those that produce beta-lactamases uh, or enzymes that can break down beta-lactam or penicillin. 
the classic example here, uh, the, the microbe that does that, probably the one that really comes to the surface in my mind, is Haemophilus influenza that produces beta-lactamases. Uh, but there are a number of others that will, that will as well. So we classify these, uh, the beta-lactams and penicillins in particular. Uh, the penicillins as a group of all have the beta-lactam ring, and they fall into four major penicillin groups. Uh, the narrow-spectrum penicillinase sensitive, the narrow-spectrum penicillinase resistant, the broader-spectrum penicillins, and then the extended-spectrum penicillins. So as we sort of look at this in this one table of the penicillins, this is a uh, beta-lactams and all beta-lactams, all penicillins, uh, are uh, penicillin G and pen BK. Uh, penicillin G is given only intravenously. Penicillin V, potassium, is given orally. A uh, pretty limited role for penicillin G, particularly uh, it's effective for uh, some strep uh, particularly strep viridens, we see it for a few other strep infections as well. Uh, but penicillin itself has a somewhat limited role. Uh, we use it for other conditions like syphilis, it's effective for, in fact, it's one of the only antibiotics that is. Um, but we'll see that uh, it has uh, some limited role, just penicillin G or pen BK. The next uh, <coughs> uh, group of penicillins are those that produce uh, or, or have the capacity to be somewhat resistant to penicillinases. Uh, and the big groups of the drugs here are cloxicillin or dicloxicillin, which we don't really use much anymore, uh, nafcillin and oxicillin, which we still occasionally use. It's a relatively narrow spectrum agent for which if you have a microbe that's producing a penicillinase, uh, you will find that these drugs sometimes effective. An older group in this class, which you have, will have name recognition for, is methicillin. Methicillin also uh, is a pretty effective agent for some strains of, among others, Staph aureus, but you can recognize just by its name that we have a methicillin-resistant Staph, or Staph aureus, or MRSA. Uh, while we don't use methicillin much anymore, partly because it's probably a little more toxic than some of the others in this group, uh, we still consider uh, those strains of Staph aureus that are resistant to methicillin as MRSA or methicillin-resistant Staph aureus. Uh, the third group we'll see are the amino penicillins, uh, and of this group we really think of amoxicillin and ampicillin, uh, and sometimes in combination uh, with another moiety that renders the spectrum a little bit lo longer or uh, broader, and, and we'll talk about that in a bit. But amoxicillin uh, is actually a surprisingly effective agent for a number of pathogens. Uh, we see it true for Haemophilus influenza. We see it uh, has a reasonably good anaerobe coverage, oral anaerobes in particular, uh, effective for uh, a number of other pathogens as well. So we see amoxicillin or amoxicillin clavulanate or ampicillin or ampicillin sulbactam used for sometimes skin and soft tissue infections sometimes. We'll see it used for otitis media very commonly. We'll see it used for strep throat. Uh, you'll see it used for prophylaxis for folks who have a risk for endocarditis, uh, bacterial endocarditis with like dental procedures and the like. So uh, it has a pretty reasonable spectrum of activity, pretty widely used agent. The extended penicillins are sort of the canons in this group. They're the broadest of spectrum. And of all of these, the agent you'll probably see used most these days is Pripercillin tazobactam, uh, or the brand name of this is Zosin. Uh, and given only intravenously, uh, it covers anaerobes. It covers gram-positive. Uh, to some degree, it does not cover methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, though. Uh, it will cover uh, a good number of grand negatives, including coverage we always think about for Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Uh, and so it is an anti-pseudomonal penicillin, covers anaerobes well. Uh, it, we use this agent pretty widely in the hospital. Uh, we are pretty grateful that, surprisingly, we don't have more resistance uh, to Pripercillin and Tazobactam uh, at this point in time than uh, than we would almost expect because it's such a widely used uh, agent. But it's sort of our workhorse agent for uh, hospital-acquired pneumonias, for serious uh, 
uh, infections where we worry about broad coverage until we can narrow our uh, activity or isolate an organism and do a more narrow spectrum agent. When we think about the penicillins, uh, we think about uh, allergy as well, and you can do skin testing if somebody says they're allergic to penicillin. Many times folks will say they're allergic to penicillin, but what happened is they might have had an upset stomach or they had some other sort of problem or that just somebody told them they were allergic to penicillin, so they carry that on their medical record. Uh, over time, the true allergies may or may not be real. It's hard to know that. Uh, but whenever we consider a patient who tells us they've had a something that looks like a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction, hives, urticaria, or immediate reactions, uh, or anaphylaxis, angioedema, something like that, then we are very leery of using any beta-lactam at all in those patients, particularly avoiding penicillin. So when we look at a patient who comes with an allergy of penicillin, we need to ask what their history is. Uh, and if it's not a type 1 hypersensitivity, they may actually be a candidate for other beta-lactams, not penicillins per se, but we'll talk about in a couple minutes the cephalosporins, which are related to the penicillins, but uh, are not, uh, they have a beta-lactam ring, but there's less cross-reactivity for allergic reactions. <clears throat> the considerations we think of uh, when we think of penalogies is that it's probably of all of the drug allergies that are seen, penicillin is probably the one we think of most often. Uh, reactions, though, can vary. We can have cross-reactivity, certainly among the penicillin. So if somebody has a true type 1 hypersensitive reaction to penicillin, we can't use amoxicillin. We cannot use piperacillin tazobactam. Uh, we, uh, and if they have a true type 1, we're going to probably avoid most of the other beta-lactams as well. We're particularly worried about these immediate anaphylactic type of reactions. Uh, and we think of its mechanism is that uh, it usually is re results when uh, the individual becomes hypersensitive to a portion of the penicillin molecule. And we don't know whether that's often the beta-lactam ring or something else. So let's look at some of these agents more specifically. First of all, penicillin G, older agent that's been around uh, probably one of the first of the penicillins. Uh, it has some gram-positive uh, and some gram-negative coverage, but somewhat limited. Uh, it's not effective against anything that produces penicillinases. Uh, there's a number of those agents uh, that are true. <clears throat> uh, it's a first choice for gram-positive coxide that are sensitive to penicillins. This could be true in meningitis, endocarditis, pneumonias, but in clinical practice, uh, because there's so much resistance, we don't often see it used empirically. It's used only when we have isolated and, or a pathogen that is sensitive to penicillin. That's usually the case. We have the penicillinase resistant or the anti-staphylococcal penicillins. We talked about methicillin, napcillin, or oxacillin. Uh, we don't actually see these used all that much, but when you've got a pathogen that is sensitive to this, particularly in someone, for example, who might have endocarditis, infection in their heart valves, then it may make sense to consider uh, use of uh, one of these anti-staphylococcal penicillins. The broader spectrum penicillins, the amino penicillins, like amoxicillin or ampicillin uh, or uh, back ampicillin, which is not really commonly used, at least in our geographic area in the northeast United States, uh, what we'll see here is uh, a pretty wide used widely used agent. Uh, it's an alternative for certain staph and strep infections, particularly strep, uh, and uh, effective for otitis, effective for uh, a number of other conditions uh, we'll talk about uh, in a bit when we talk about the indications for uh, many of these agents. But uh, pretty much of a workhorse agent you'll see used pretty commonly. The extended penicillins are also workhorse agents in acute care settings. Uh, so if you work in a hospital, you'll see particularly piperacillin tazobactam uh, associated uh, with coverage uh, against, among other things, pseudomonas. And when we're talking about hospital or healthcare-associated infections, particularly healthcare-associated respiratory infections, but others as well, uh, we worry about pseudomonas because pseudomonas is a pretty serious pathogen that uh, has difficulty in what gets covers it. And piperacillin tazobactam, interestingly, covers it pretty well. 
Whenever we use a beta-lactam, we're always concerned about the possibility of whether or not the pathogen we're uh, looking at, uh, aiming at uh, with that beta-lactam uh, produces a beta-lactamase. Uh, you may remember this from basic microbiology. Uh, there are different subtypes of beta-lactamases, uh, and then there are inhibitors that are available that are more specific to that type of beta-lactamase. So it's not really critical that you uh, you know, differentiate the four molecular classes of the beta-lactamases or uh, match those up directly with the inhibitors that are associated with being effective against uh, those uh, particular beta-lactamases. But just keep in mind that each of the beta-lactams uh, might be more or less specific for the type of beta-lactamase uh, which renders it uh, uh, that beta-lactam inactive. Many times we will take one of these penicillins and combine it with a beta-lactamase inhibitor. These inhibitors are, uh, have been around for a couple of decades now, uh, and you will see the tazobactam component of piperacillin is a beta-lactamase inhibitor. The sulbactam inhibitor, uh, uh, sulbactam component with ampicillin uh, in combination is a brand name product, Unison. Uh, and augmentin, very commonly used uh, ha as a combination of the beta-lactamase uh, inhibitor clavulanate with amoxicillin. Uh, they're pretty widely uh, used in combination. Uh, they are uh, broad in the spectrum for any of the agents, particularly Mothlose influenza, but others as well, uh, that uh, they need the pathogens that produce a beta-lactamase. So periodically, you're going to see in this particular slide deck, you're going to see this slide with an area that's highlighted. And I would really encourage you to become very familiar with this graphic or something like it. Uh, if you happen to have a Sanford guide, uh, usually there's a nice table in Sanford that gives you uh, this kind of information. And this is, in a sense, similar to an antibiogram, except this gives you a little less specific information and certainly not geographically specific. But it gives you some information or framework to think about which classes or which agents specifically cover which pathogens. And so across the top, let's look at what we're sort of dividing the broad scope of pathogens, and there's exceptions to this rule. Far left is methicillin-resistant Staph aureus. And in this day and age, when you're talking particularly about skin soft tissue or healthcare-associated infections, we're always thinking MRSA as a potential pathogen and whether we need to cover that. And as you'll see, the penicillins we just spoke about do not cover methicillin resistant Staph aureus. Uh, for then we think about other gram positive infections, uh, and the penicillins are reasonably good for many other gram positives, particularly uh, Staph and Strep, uh, Strep particularly. <clears throat> um, and then the gram negatives. There are many gram negatives we think of. One of those gram negatives is across the top is, is also Pseudomonas, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And in this case, Pseudomonas is a, uh, we, we have a limited availability of what covers Pseudomonas, that things that may cover other gram negatives quite well may not cover Pseudomonas. And so Pseudomonas we always worry about in particularly healthcare associated or healthcare acquired uh, infections. <clears throat> Uh, and then uh, the last two over to the right are anaerobes. We worry about anaerobes if there are uh, infections that are deep-seated in pockets. For example, we worry about these for dental infections underneath the gum line or in the tooth, for example. Uh, anaerobes seem to uh, have a, a particular uh, propensity to uh, cause a dental infections or mouth-borne infections. We also worry about anaerobes if the oral contents get aspirated into the lungs. So if someone has an aspiration pneumonia, we may want to think, well, then we need to cover for oral anaerobes. We think about anaerobes as infections in uh, gut or below the diaphragm infections. This could be GI infections, uh, trauma to the gut, gunshot wounds, for example, uh, appendicitis. Uh, and the, one of the agents we worry about there is the anaerobacteroides, Bacteroides fragilis, which has a more limited uh, spec, you know, has, has had some resistance to some of the combinations we've historically used. And finally, on the far right are the atypicals, and the atypicals are often agents that are seen in patients with 
uh, community-acquired pneumonia, particularly younger patients with a community-acquired uh, pneumonia that we want to make sure we cover for them. <clears throat> so as we think about the penicillins we just spoke of that are blocked here, we'll see that they have reasonably good coverage of gram-positive, and as our spectrum increased, uh, we saw more coverage for some of the gram-negatives. And the only anti-pseudomonal penicillins really are piperacillin tazobactam. Uh, so if we become pseudomonas, one of the reasons why piperacillin tazobactam is a workhorse in healthcare settings uh, is that it, all, it has a pretty nice spectrum. It covers virtually everything you want to cover. It uh, covers anaerobes. It covers uh, pseudomonas. It covers gram-negatives, most gram-positives. Where piperacillin tazobactam doesn't cover is MRSA. It doesn't cover atypical. So you wouldn't use it in community-acquired pneumonia, or you need to add something that covers for atypicals. And then if you think MRSA is a potential pathogen, then you need to add on something else that covers MRSA. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Let's shift gears now a bit and talk about the cephalosporins. Cephalosporins are chemically related to the penicillins. You'll see the same beta-lactam ring uh, in more or less the center of the molecule, but you'll see some differences uh, in the side chains that are uh, used in, uh, uh, that are associated with uh, many of the beta-lactams. <clears throat> uh, so they're chemically similar, but they're not identical. Their spectrum is different uh, uh, in some regards, uh, and yet the spectrum has a lot of similarity as well. They have key advantages depending on the generation, and there are five generations of cephalosporins. They're, in a sense, divided by historically uh, when the agents came to market. Uh, I'll, uh, I did, uh, you'd kind of recognize that the first generation cephalosporins have probably the oldest agents, so it's been around for the longest time. Uh, but in general, you'll find that the first generation agents have a more narrow spectrum uh, than the later generations do with some notable exceptions. The other issue we think about is that the beta-lactams uh, as a group, you can have hypersensitivity to them, but for folks who have a true allergic reaction to a penicillin, this may be about a 10% or so cross-reactivity with cephalosporins. That 10%, it would be too high, too much of a risk if somebody had a hypersensitivity reaction that involved IgE or uh, anaphylaxis type of reaction, we would not even want to take that 10% chance risk unless there were really no alternative therapies and it was a life-threatening infection. And then we would still be very careful about introducing cephalosporin. So we're very careful about cross-reactivity uh, as it relates to hypersensitivity reactions uh, when we use cephalosporins in a patient with some penicillin or beta-lactam allergy history. Here's more or less a, a, a classification of the commonly used cephalosporins, and those that are in gray here are largely gone by the wayside. We don't use those at all. Uh, the first generation agents, cephazolin given IV, cephalexin or cephadroxyl, particularly cephalexin is the oral form you'll see pretty commonly still used, the old brand name of Keflex. Uh, the cephazolin is ANCEF, and cephazolin still is a pretty widely used agent for surgical prophylaxis. Uh, a little less so than it used to be uh, because it does not cover MRSA, but other than that, it covers uh, many of the gram-positive pathogens you worry about in many surgical procedures where you're looking at covering staph and strep as it relates to uh, an infection uh, from the skin during the surgical procedure where you're breaking into the skin and through the skin uh, to get to the surgical site. Uh, the second generation agents are uh, pretty much limited to really two agents, maybe three, is cefox uh, cefoxitin and cefatitan, uh, and also cefuroxine to some extent is an oral form. Uh, cefoxitin and cef uh, cefatitan are, cover most of the things you'd see with the first generation. The advantage cefoxitin and cefatitan have is that they cover anaerobes. And so you will sometimes see these used for... Uh, GYN infections. Someone, for example, who has pelvic inflammatory disease, uh, intra-abdominal infections, maybe appendicitis, uh, because they are reasonably good at covering some anaerobes uh, that uh, other agents might. So they might be a candidate for those patients. The third generation cephalosporins, uh, there are many of them. 
the oral, a the IV agent that's used probably most commonly in the third generation group is ceftriaxone. Ceftriaxone, brand name of Rocephin, uh, has historically been a great agent to use for community acquired pneumonias uh, in that it covers most things that you'd see with community acquired pneumonia with the exception of atypical coverage. Um, and it's used also for chronically, has been uh, long term has been used for, for example, gonorrhea uh, infections given IM or intravenously. Uh, of the other agents here, there are a number of them that are oral, uh, suffixime, cefpidoxime, uh, are sometimes used. A little broader spectrum than the first generation agents uh, have, have a role, uh, a somewhat limited role, but a role when a third generation cephalosporin makes sense. Then the other agent in this group, in the, in the third generation agents that you'd really want to look at, is the only one in the group that covers pseudomonas, and that's ceftazidine. Uh, I don't see as much ceftazidine use in the last maybe decade or so. It used to be a workhorse for us when we had to cover uh, pseudomonas, and for some reason we couldn't use an agent like piperacillin and tazobactam. Then there are the fourth and the fifth generation agents. The fourth generation agent, uh, cefepime, has largely replaced uh, ceftazidine because it covers pseudomonas quite well. Uh, and that's really its claim to fame. Pretty broad spectrum covering pseudomonas. Also, we'll see this used for some folks where we need really pseudomonal coverage, pretty broad coverage, but we don't need to necessarily cover anaerobes or we don't need to cover MRSA. Um, but it will cover pseudomonas as well. And, and probably the newest on the block is the fifth generation ceftaroline, uh, which has some gram-positive uh, gram coverage that's a little broader uh, and has a, a, a niche uh, developing for its use. Uh, but in, in, at least in the practice areas I've been in the Northeast United States, this agent we haven't seen really take off, where at least where I've practiced. So the adverse effects of the cephalosporins are generally like the beta-lactams, well-tolerated, probably uh, one of the safest groups of antibacterial allergic reactions, less common probably uh, than we see with the penicillins, but still... A, an issue, so we worry about that, uh, and we worry about cross-reactivity. Some of the uh, second-generation agents were associated with some bleeding risks related to their side chains uh, off the beta-lactam ring. We sometimes get a little cautious about bleeding risk with these agents, but truth be told, for the agents that have remained on the market, uh, we rarely consider uh, clinically important bleeding associated with these agents. They're also, like we could see with some of the penicillins, particularly we didn't talk about this, is uh, thrombophlebitis, IV infusion site irritation. And that's actually even worse for a couple of the penicillin derivatives, particularly napcillin and oxicillin are kind of notorious for that, irritating at the venous site. Um, uh, but you can see that with, uh, with the cephalosporin sometimes as well. So the cephalosporins are a pretty broad spectrum, and, and the, the larger the generation, the more broad it is. For first generations, we see uh, some staph and strep coverage uh, and could be used in someone with a mild pen allergy. Uh, doesn't cover MRSA, but most other skin flora. So we can see it used for cellulitis. You can see it used for some urinary tract infections. Uh, it has enough gram-negative coverage that's reasonable in many cases, particularly things like Klebsiella, E. coli, uh, often, depending on the antibiogram, okay. Second-generation agents have limited roles, sometimes otitis and sinusitis, where I think we see them used as the intra-abdominal infections, pelvic inflections for cefoxetin uh, and cefotetan because of their anaerobe coverage. The third generations have each have their own niche. Ceftriaxone uh, is the third-generation agent. Uh, interestingly, even though it is very highly protein bound to a human, plasma protein bound, interestingly also does cross the blood brain barrier pretty well uh, and gets good penetration uh, in meningitis. And so, really high doses of ceftriaxone that are pretty well tolerated, doses of 2 grams every 12 hours IV, are routinely given for uh, meningitis in most cases empirically until you isolate something if you ever do. Um, and so, uh, uh, third-generation agents like uh, 
um, ceftriaxone don't have a role there. Uh, but typically, you look at the agents and you, you look at the spectrum of activity, the patient issues with allergies, the site of infection, can the drug get there? All of those are factors we think about when we choose which agent, including which cephalosporin. Cephalosporins with pen allergies, uh, the data is kind of all over the map, but uh, you'll find that somewhere between 1 to 10 percent of patients who have a reaction to a penicillin may have a reaction also to a cephalosporin. And so we, uh, depending on the data you look at, uh, most of the time the reason why the rates are often reported lower is because a patient never had a true penicillin allergy in the first place. Uh, and so you'll find a sort of a wide range of perspective on how serious that is. But if you've got someone who had a true type 1 hypersensitive reaction to penicillin, we're going to be very cautious about uh, using acephalosporin in that patient. So here are, is the graphic we think of uh, for the cephalosporins and encourage you to kind of kind of embed this in your mind that gram uh, first generation agents cover gram positives and some gram negatives. Uh, second generation is a little better with gram positive, gram negatives. And then cefoxtin and cefotitin are unique in that they cover anaerobes. No other cephalosporins do. The third generation agents that cover uh, Pseudomonas, uh, the only one is ceftazidine. The others are pretty good for gram, some gram positive, a little better gram negative coverage. Uh, the fourth generation agents uh, and uh, cover, uh, really that's just cefepime, cover Pseudomonas and most gram positive, gram negative. Uh, and then the newest fifth generation agent has some MRSA coverage, and so that's a real advantage of it. Uh, but at least in the clinical practice areas I'm in, I've not seen it really used to any great extent. Okay, let's look at a few other uh, beta-lactams here. Uh, one is the monobactam uh, as trianem, and then we'll talk a bit more about the carbapenems, which are pretty widely used in practice. Uh, as trianem, uh, as a monobactam, has pretty limited role uh, in that it covers uh, some gram negatives uh, reasonably well. Uh, although not particularly effective uh, for pseudomonas. And then the carbapenems are, in a sense, quite a bit like uh, the tip uh, type uh, uh, piperacillin tazobactam, uh, the extended penicillins, uh, maybe even a little bit broader in their spectrum. And of these, the two that are used most commonly are imipenem and meropenem. Uh, Doropenem I've not seen used, at least in Northeast, uh, in the last 10 years or so, or eight years since it's been out. Um, and ertapenem has a role uh, in that it covers most things, but unfortunately doesn't cover pseudomonas very well. But the carbapenems cover anaerobes, uh, they cover uh, uh, most other things except for MRSA. All right, let's look at the carbapenem uh, agent imipenem or premaxin. Uh, a, a lot of uh, Gram positive and some gram negative coverage doesn't cover MRSA, but covers almost everything else with anaerobes. Has to be given intravenously. Uh, adverse effects, uh, the because of its broad spectrum, we worry about super infections. This is true probably with some of the other broader spectrum agents as well. Uh, occasionally, in high doses, we see patients actually have seizures. That can be true with other very high dose penicillins, but pretty rare. Imipenem probably the one associated with seizures the most of all of. Uh, all of the beta-lactams. Uh, and GI effects also can be noted as a problem. It's uh, historically imipenem pretty widely used, largely replaced by meropenem. Uh, and in many cases, uh, many hospitals or healthcare systems have the carbapenems on a uh, restriction that you have to have approval by the infectious disease service, uh, really because they're such broad agents. We really uh, are beginning to worry about resistance developing, particularly resistance against pseudomonas. Uh, and so we see this, these agents sort of uh, having a little tighter rein in when and how we use them as part of our antimicrobial stewardship uh, policies and procedures around the country. We talked a bit about the beta-lactamase inhibitors, and those can be added to a lot of agents. Uh, we first look at some of the bacteria that produce beta-lactamases. Uh, mycobacterium TB does, and so we that's why we don't often add beta-lactamases for TB coverage, but in fact we'll talk about 
when we talk about TB using multiple agents, not a single agent. Uh, we worry about beta-lactamase with MRSA, uh, with other staph infections for endobacteriaceae. Haemophilus influenza probably the one I think of most commonly. Uh, Neisseria can do it, Klebsiella, Citrobacter, Morganella. And the four beta-lactamases that are commonly used are clavulanate, sulbactam, tazobactam, and the newest one on the blog, avabactam. Uh, so here are some of the combinations that we see uh, with uh, some of the beta-lactamase inhibitors in, uh, in clinical practice. Uh, some of these are under trial and some of them are available. Really, of all of these, really the two or three that you will see commonly used is Augmentin, amoxicillin, clavulanate, uh, unison, ampicillin, sulbactam, which is IV, and zosin, which is piperacillin, tazobactam, which is also IV. So as we look at these agents, the carbapenems uh, cover gram-positive, gram-negative, and anaerobes well. The, problem, the only issue is ertapenem doesn't cover pseudomonas. And then as trianem, consider this pretty much gram-negative uh, with some pseudomonal coverage, but I will say that in a lot of settings, uh, we have a lot of resistance uh, with pseudomonas uh, with uh, as trianem. And so clinically in practice, uh, we don't really see uh, as trianem used when you think pseudomonas is a picture. Okay, at this point in the presentation, everything we've talked about uh, uh, to this point uh, are the beta-lactams. Uh, we'll now change gears and talk about non-beta-lactams. But important for you to be able to differentiate the agents we've spoken about already, which are all beta-lactams, uh, uh, apart from the agents we're going to talk about from this point forward, the non-beta-lactams, in that if someone has a hypersensitivity reaction to one beta-lactam, uh, they can have a uh, cross-reactivity with a different beta-lactam. Certainly, the penicillins themselves, uh, the cross-reactivity uh, for one penicillin uh, is very high with another. Uh, for cephalosporins, uh, uh, for a patient who has a uh, hypersensitivity reaction to a penicillin, uh, is real, and we generally avoid those if the patient has had a serious type 1 hypersensitivity. Uh, but if it's not a type 1 hypersensitivity and we're in a pinch, we sometimes will use, for example, a cephalosporin in a patient with an uh, allergic reaction to penicillin as long as we're pretty confident it wasn't a type 1 type reaction. And there really are no alternatives but that cephalosporin to use. Uh, we'll speak uh, in, from this point forward about the non-beta-lactams. And for someone who has a pen allergy or a beta-lactam allergy, the agents we speak from this point forward generally are not problematic.